All right. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our Dot Talks webinar series, our faculty series. This afternoon, we have a speaker from the Department of Philosophy from the Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, Dr. Prasanjit Biswas. Uh, he is currently an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy there and also a published author. Uh, I'm sure all of you have already read in his bio that he is uh, a post-structuralist philosopher. And in his recent writings, he's brought about the links between the pandemic, the economy, and the norms of distancing. So Dr. Prasanji, thank you for joining us on Dot Talks webinar and welcome to everyone who's also here to listen. Uh, we are looking forward to an informative and engaging session. This afternoon, Dr. Prasanjit is here to talk about the pandemic that's affecting us worldwide right now. Uh, we really do hope to learn more about, as he's mentioned in his brief concept note, the power structures at play that are affecting both the real and also the virtual world, also the politics behind this pandemic, and both the economic and social ramifications that it's bringing about. Dr. Prasenjit has asked us for a 45-minute presentation this afternoon, so it will be a 45-minute pre presentation. I will be the moderator for the session as well as the timekeeper, so I will be keeping a check of the time as well. And uh, after that, we'll be following, that will be followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Uh, so participants, if you have any questions, uh, you can unmute yourselves during the Q&A session and ask your questions. In the meantime, as Dr. Prasanjit speaks, if you have any questions that come to mind, then you can also type it in the chat box so that we can take it later. Okay, so uh, without wasting any more time, I'll just directly give the rest of the time to Dr. Prasanjit. Uh, you may um, take your time. Okay, I think Dr. Prasanj is having a little bit of network connections. He seemed to have just left the meeting. Um, let's just wait for a few minutes so that he can rejoin us. Sorry for this, uh, everyone. Let's give him some time to log back in. Okay, yeah, he's here. So Dr. Prasanji, you may take your time. I think you have to unmute yourself because uh, we can't hear you right now. Oh, Dr. Prasanji, we're not able to hear you. I think you have to unmute, uh, use the unmute button. Your microphone is muted, Dr. Prasenji. Uh, on the Google Hangouts, uh, on the app, you'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, maybe Dr. R R Rimi or our IT team, if you're able to get to him, you can help him out. That might be- Yeah, Matt, let me just- Okay, but is it not in on through his phone or through his laptop? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he just needs to unmute his microphone on the app, the Google Hangouts. Because I think his earplugs seem fine. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, yes. yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, sir. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hear okay. You. So nice of you uh, for this for this introduction. But uh, because of some audio disturbances, probably I couldn't follow everything. Uh, okay. But uh, thank you for inviting, inviting me and uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you, which is uh, about the uh, situation of the pandemic. Uh, in which all of us are in at this moment and um, how we should look at the situation and how we should understand 
various uh, complications and implications of the situation are the important issues before us. So I go into uh, the body of my talk and I plan to talk at about uh, 35 to 40 minutes, uh, leaving you time for interaction. I think that format will be all right, isn't it? Hello. Yes, Hello, that's, that sounds perfect. Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay. That sounds perfect, okay. sir. Yeah. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. So I begin. Uh, the question of a pandemic uh, is something which is uh, uh, which is uh, quite repetitive uh, in human history. Uh, back in 1918, we had this uh, massive plague uh, in Europe, which has killed almost like uh, 10 million people at that point of time, uh, which was spread over more than two years and it ended up by killing 10 million people or more. Uh, back in 1918, what had happened was uh, not really uh, a, a, a disease or a disease caused by a microbe, which is uh, not in the control of the human beings. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, in the last century, the medical um, facilities were not that appropriate to face the bubonic plague, and therefore there were huge casualties. Right at this moment, given our medical facilities, the availability of um, ventilators and uh, uh, personal protection equipments and uh, various other protective measures that we have in place, because of that, the fatality rate, even in the United States of America, is uh, around uh, 3%. Uh, which means that out of um, a, a total of um, uh, six lakhs uh, patients, uh, only uh, a few thousands, uh, around 20,000 people have died. And many of them died because of other complications in their body, not directly because of the COVID. In case of India, as you all know, the fatality rate is even lesser. Only 1,500 patients have died so far out of uh, around 50,000 cases that we have. And in that 1,500, only 370 or 80 cases uh, are directly due to COVID. So therefore, what I wanted to say is that like the bubonic plague, this pandemic created by this novel COVID virus is not a life-threatening one. It doesn't kill except in cases of comorbidity. That is when one has certain kind of other infections like diabetic or myocardial infection or certain other major organ related diseases. In such cases, COVID hits very hard. If someone is otherwise healthy, chances are that that person will survive around 95%. So therefore, even if somebody is COVID infected, the chance of his or her survival is quite, quite high, depending on the medication at the right time, hospitalization, and other care mechanism. So therefore, what I wanted to say is that fear and the kind of global fear that has been attached in the name of this novel virus is somewhat exaggerated, somewhat excessive. The exaggerated state of fear has created a huge scare in the entire world. Even in Italy, where largest number of people have died so far, they are able to manage the disease to the point that after April uh, 20th, we didn't hear of much deaths in Italy. Therefore, a certain way of managing the disease is always available. If these ways of managing the disease were unavailable, then probably, our exaggerated fear could have been a little more justified. But at this point of time, there is no reason to be afraid of COVID, provided one has put in place certain facilities and certain mechanism. Therefore, uh, the World Health Organization, World Health Organization has already stated that uh, the fatality rate and the rate of reproduction of the virus is uh, slowing down across the world. And Indian Council of Medical Research in the context of India has noted, noted with a, a little tinge of, uh, uh, little tinge of uh, comfort uh, that uh, after May 1st, 
uh, the, the virus has slowed down. And the indication that virus has slowed down is pretty clear, except that there are certain areas which are marked as red zones now, where uh, there is a spread of the virus because of uh, the asymptomatic cases uh, who, whose contacts are being traced all the time. So therefore, even in the red zones, the so-called red zones, the spread of the virus and its impact is somewhat limited by so many factors, including the, the medical ways of containing it, apart from certain other administrative and public health uh, measures that, um, that government or people of India have already adopted. And one of the major measures at this point is that of lockdown. And the question that arose with lockdown are manifold, whether in the name of containing virus, lockdown is leading to a certain kind of economic collapse, whether it is leading to a massive spread of hunger because uh, a large section of India's population, estimated around 45 crores, depend heavily on uh, a daily wage earning. And they have to go to work and they do not have the leisure and the facility to just remain and stay at home, which is prescribed that you stay home and you stay safe. But in case of a large segment of our people who depend on uh, their work in informal sector, and whose wages are earned on a daily basis, uh, for them, uh, the, the situation of lockdown has been pretty, uh, pretty, pretty bad. Uh, they have been threatened with hunger. They have been threatened with unemployment and loss of their income, and thereby creating a, a kind of a crisis of human security, which uh, could not have been foreseen before uh, the lockdown was announced. But as lockdown crossed its 42nd day, and today we are on 43rd day of the lockdown, it is pretty clear that across the country, in various remote parts, there is a certain kind of crisis of food, of food shortage. Although the stock of food is pretty high in this country, we have almost um, uh, 600 uh, million tons of surplus grains in our, in our go-downs under Food Corporation of India. It depends on how this surplus amount of food will be distributed among the uh, poor and the needy. And uh, because of the last mine problem, which is the problem of uh, it is not possible to really ensure that the last man receives the necessary staple food that is absolutely needed for survival. Uh, given this kind of a uh, break between what we have and what we are able to deliver, there is a certain sense of economic crisis, a crisis of human well-being or a crisis of human security that is pervading at this moment across the country. Uh, how we tackle it on that, I will deliberate a little deeper. But before, um, but, but for now, I go into something else. And the point here is that uh, whether lockdown helps us in flattening the curve, there is a worldwide debate on this matter. Whether lockdown really allows us to build up long-term immunity in the community, or lockdown is just meant for buying some time or building up the medical facility. Uh, somebody wrote very, very succinctly that the relaxations that are given in the lockdown now is meant for, uh, meant for using some ICU beds that are available at this point of time. So lockdown is not for uh, wasting away the freedom that is granted, but it simply means that if you really are not able to act in a responsible manner, you can be accommodated in some ventilators and ICUs, which are made ready using the first and second uh, term of the lockdown. Now we are the lockdown 3.0, where uh, we are building up further facilities of quarantine and also uh, medical facilities that are needed to contain the disease. Therefore, a few more people, a few thousand more, if they are infected by uh, COVID, can be accommodated in those facilities. But there are data analysts who are pointing out that if COVID spreads at this rate, let's say in a state like Maharashtra, where you see a huge spot of cases uh, since yesterday, and also in Delhi, 
whether ventilators will be able to uh, uh, cover this entire huge infected people uh, is a major question. Or, it, or ventilators and ICU beds are going to be exhausted in another 10 days time. The data analyst pointed out that ICU and ventilator facilities will get exhausted, provided at this rate COVID expands beyond the middle of May. By the end of May, all our ICUs and ventilators are going to be exhausted. If uh, uh, yesterday there was a massive rise of almost 2,700 cases, if at this rate cases rise, that is 2,700 per day unto the end of May now, which is most unlikely. I hope such a tragic situation will not arise in this country because the virus is slowing down. Therefore, it is hopefully expected that the current level of ICUs, beds, and facilities that we have would be suffice, would suffice this part in the rise of uh, the infected cases, and people can be provided the necessary medical amenities in case it is needed. So therefore, what all this means is that uh, lockdown by itself is no guarantee to contain the virus. To contain and to slow down the spread of the virus, it also depends on a certain sense of responsibility. And the responsibility that is bestowed on each of us is to see that uh, we do not violate uh, the norms of safe distancing. We do not violate the norms of gathering beyond the safe limit. So even inside the household and in our old, in our small localities, people should not be gathering unnecessarily because no one knows from where infection can spread. But good news is that there is no community transmission as yet in India. And especially in the context of Northeast, in all the seven states, now that there's a little spot in the state of Tripura because of, uh, because of spread of the virus in BSF and CRPF probably, uh, without that, among the civil population, there's hardly any, any spike in the infected cases. Only in Assam, you have around uh, 30 cases of which um, 24 or so are already relieved after treatment. Uh, only nine cases are there here and there in Assam. Uh, added to that are these Tripuras, uh, almost uh, 40 cases and one or two cases elsewhere, makes it around 50 cases across the Northeast, which uh, for a 45 million people uh, who, who stay in Northeast, 4.5 crore people who live in Northeast, for 45 million people, you have 50 cases, which is a certain kind of a blessing, seemingly, as somebody has speculated, that uh, maybe people of Northeast has better immunity and how this immunity is created is a civilizational process. The kind of food, the kind of weather, the climate, eating habit, and also the habits of cultivation and also working physically in the field are major factors for building up this kind of an immunity among the ethnic communities of the Northeast. Apart from that, someone else has also pointed out very, very interestingly that uh, uh, the, the, the prevalent situation of inter-ethnic conflict in the case of Northeast India is much, much contained, is much down, is much uh, restrained at this point of uh, COVID infection. In a sense, COVID infection has brought various ethnic communities together, and there is a shared sense of uh, responsibility. There is a shared sense of um, uh, jointly experiencing the grief and or, or the uh, kind of immunity that is built up in the community of the Northeast, in the communities of the Northeast. So, so uh, COVID has brought us together in the form of a bigger community, moving beyond our small, narrow ethnic identities, as somebody has pointed out. One of the social scientists, um, Professor Amar Yumnam, pointed this out uh, yesterday in a TV discussion, which is a very, very significant point.
which uh, we shall delve into. Now, uh, I want to also take you to a certain kind of a philosophical discussion. Uh, as we see that the COVID situation is a crisis situation, many people describe it to be an emergency situation. Now, the question is, in an emergency situation, whether keeping out uh, all debates and discussions, we can formulate certain norms and principles of life and impose it unilaterally on the people. And this is a question related to governance and the institutional processes of democracy, whether democratic institutions and a right-based approach are better than a command system whereby certain norms and rules are rigorously uh, rigorously imposed on a people. I can give you the example of uh, Philippines, where the dictator of Philippines, the president of Philippines, stated that lockdown violators need to be shot at. Uh, in some cases, some people advocated this kind of a police access or administrative access in the name of containing lockdown violation. But in case of India, uh, the, the laws pertaining to lockdown and its violation follow certain base principles of uh, uh, human rights or, uh, or fundamental rights as enshrined in our constitution. Our constitution says, even under emergency, right to life and the individual liberty cannot be curbed. So under COVID emergency, also right to life and individual liberty cannot be curbed. The curb that we have, uh, we have by our own mutual consent is accepted is that of uh, reducing the chain of transmission of COVID, if any. Now, this reduction in the chain of transmission of COVID uh, is because of the collective sense of safety and security of the entire community. But within that, if someone exercises a little bit of individual liberty, if somebody moves out on a certain purpose, on a certain call, and, and if that person is penalized, by using harsh coercive laws, uh, that actually curbs the fundamental freedoms that are guaranteed under the Indian constitution. We have witnessed the specter of police penalizing people on the roadside. Now this kind of brutality, this kind of penalizing of people is not permitted by the constitution at all. This violates the very spirit of democracy. Now, how does one enforce lockdown then? Some people would argue that unless we have strict laws, laws which make people afraid, unless we have such laws on which people are fearful, you can't impose a norm on the people because people by their very nature are indisciplined and they are inherently chaotic. Now, this kind of an argumentation might facilitate a certain rise of authoritarian tendencies in a political democracy like ours. So therefore, how do we keep out authoritarianism? Uh, therefore, uh, is a major, major question. How do we clear ourselves out of any possible authoritarian uh, tendency that might build up within our polity is an important question. Uh, is, there, is it possible to have a fairly democratic, a fairly discussive, a fairly deliberative mode of understanding what should be the role of an individual in case we have to follow certain restrictions in the interest of the safety of the community. Now, restrictions do not necessarily constrain the individual liberty. And individual liberty to really have a certain way of life without disturbing others. Uh, is something uh, very, very important, or rather it's the hallmark of a political democracy. Now, the very suspicion that someone else can be a carrier, uh, if it is just a suspicion, without any evidential basis, without any medical basis, um, that itself is not very fair to, sus to be suspicious of any other person. Now, to prevent such a spot in suspicion of the other people. The norm that is followed at this point of time is the norm to quarantine people. People who are quarantined 
for 14 days to 21 days have often complained of mistreatment in the quarantine center because these quarantine centers have come up overnight without much of thoughts about good management of uh, food, hygiene, and other basic necessities of people who are going to be quarantined. And we have seen certain people are quarantined as if they are in a five-star facility, while certain other people are quarantined in a very dismal manner. We have seen news items yesterday, day before yesterday, in major national newspapers, such as Times of India and Indian Express, that the migrant returnees to Bihar, to Uttar Pradesh, and certain other places of India are not really treated well. They are put inside the local school and in a classroom of the school, which is not, uh, which is not having even electricity, not to talk about uh, running water in the bathroom. Uh, in such a facility, people are huddled. Uh, and one very unfortunate, tragic uh, incident has come to light in Madhya Pradesh, where a Dalit family has been put inside a lavatory or a toilet, where they are asked to leave just because they are Dalits. So one can see a certain kind of class difference, a perpetuation, a perpetuation of social inequalities, even treating, in treating people during quarantine time. Uh, quarantine should have made everyone equal and it should have played as a leveler. But COVID didn't really play as a leveler in the case of quarantine. Quarantine became once again a question of how much one can afford and to what extent the, the facility of quarantine can provide good food and uh, certain, certain quality uh, level of life uh, became a question. Uh, the governmental facilities in such cases have not been uniform. There has been a lot of uneven uh, situations in maintaining the quarantine. And this has led to a certain kind of quarantine inequality between various strata of people. Uh, how do we remove it? Because constitution gives you equal opportunity. Uh, it, it, it is supposed to ensure a robust public health system where everyone is supposed to be treated equally. So what Kabir has brought forth is this idea of creating a robust public health system to maintain equal and fair treatment of everyone when uh, someone is put into quarantine. If that is not done, then the whole quarantine facility and the process of quarantining is not really resulting into the desired end. If the desired end is to keep everyone healthy and happy, that is not being uh, successfully met by these unequal, uneven quarantine facilities. And that is a major, major concern. Another major public debate has cropped up related to the migrant laborers. Had there not been a sudden four hour notice for lockdown, we probably would not have come across uh, in our site the, the major issue of the migrant laborers. Now, as far as Northeast is concerned, a large number of people work elsewhere. A large number of students study in various parts of India. Many of them want to return now back to Northeast as returning has been uh, made open by various states. But there are a lot of questions that are raised about these returnees and how to treat these returnees. The question is, treating every returnee with a lot of dignity and care is the most important task before the government, as well as the people who are residing in that state. Uh, maybe someone is not directly related to me, uh, not related to my uh, kin, in, in my kinship line, but um, someone should be able to ensure that such a returnee in one's own locality, in one's vicinity, in one's neighborhood is not mistreated just because one is in quarantine. There could be elderly people who needs this quarantine or there could be a person who requires support during quarantine. How the community supports such a person is a very, very important thing. Uh, otherwise, a strict imposition of quarantine rules in terms of not allowing a person to come out might result into 
hunger, uh, distress, anxiety, mental stress, and also uh, from there, a certain attempt to commit suicide as well. In some cases, quarantine people attempted to commit suicide because no facility was available in this country. So therefore, it's a question of extremely sensitive handling of the need for quarantine of the large number of returnees. The state where I currently live is Meghalaya. The state to which I belong is Assam. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss about these two states a little briefly which applies to other states of the region as well. Meghalaya government has uh, announced that almost 15,000 people would return in this uh, situation of returning back home. And at the same time, they also inform these returnees that they cannot move out of the state uh, on a long or a medium term. That is for another few months, they cannot at all move out of the state. They won't be allowed to move out of the state once they are quarantined. Now, people who are quarantined, uh, that they will not be able to move out of the state, that they won't be able to join their workplace. In that situation, who are going to sustain these people and their livelihoods, their basic income? So just as uh, Nobel laureate Avijit Banerjee suggested that um, we have to guarantee, this is the right time that we have to guarantee a universal basic income to the migrant laborers, to the people who are in formal sector and who are wage earners. And therefore it is to be ensured that at least 10,000 rupees is given to their bank accounts uh, for their, uh, meant for their expenses. And this has a sound economic logic because if people can spend the money, then only the wheels of economy can rotate again. If people are not able to spend, if they lack their purchasing power, if the prices of things are going too high and rising higher, and if people do not have purchasing power of buying the basic essentials, then the wheels of the economy cannot really rotate. So therefore, the question is, during quarantine, income of the people have to be ensured by the government. How deftly a government handles this situation for the needy is a very important question. And this requires a lot of spade work, a clear understanding of how much funding, how much money is required to sustain these people is, is absolutely important. And I can see that uh, various states are not really able to calculate how much support they need to offer to these kind of needy people in terms of protecting their livelihood and their income. There is absolutely no clear cut policy towards this. So in terms of policy, uh, in the period of quarantine, people's livelihood need to be ensured. And this is a major, major task before the entire country and especially for the states of Northeast India who are now receiving a large number of returnees from other parts of the country and maybe other parts of the globe as well. So this is an important point. The, the second most important point is that uh, that uh, apparently Northeast region is uh, somewhat free of the virus transmission. But people argue, people who are extremely cautious and who take a kind of a a uh, very cautionary position. They would say that the first wave is just over, but there could be a second wave of the virus and they draw upon this case of a second wave from 1918 bubonic plague, when second wave killed more than the first wave. But fortunately, the reproduction rate of the virus at this point of time is somewhere around 3.5. That means one infected person can at most infect 3.5 persons. But in case of India, the rate of reproduction of the virus was maximum 1.5 and it is slowed down and it will be going down to 0.5 as experts have predicted. So the predictions related to the rate of reproduction of the virus in case of India. And then in the case of Northeast India, it is pretty much encouraging because uh, this is not going to, going to going to create havoc amongst us. At most, it can create a controlled anarchy or a peaceful anarchy uh, in the case of Northeast India, meaning thereby that at most it can create 
a certain kind of um, cautionary, uh, cautionary situation where people have to be cautious. They have to be careful. Uh, but, but really, it is not more than anything being careful. So therefore, uh, being careful is the only impact that this virus with a lower reproductive rate and with a slowing down procedure at this moment can create. So how is it to be careful at this moment? As I have said, to be careful is, doesn't mean to be suspicious of the other person. So lots of people who are returning now, one has to ensure that uh, the people who are residing in a particular place are not suspicious of those people. Because if those people are following quarantine norms and they're happily accepting uh, the, the period in which they have to self-isolate themselves, if they are happily accepting that, uh, there should be every reason to support them in every possible way. And there shouldn't be any suspicion, which is based on um, uh, many things. A, suspic a suspicion can be based primarily on the sense of difference that one has with another person. And the sense of difference is perceived in terms of community, language, caste, tribe, ethnicity, religion, and region as well. So therefore, all these factors of difference, which through which people perceive how someone else is different from someone else, uh, will play out even in treating these returnees. But this playing out should not be uh, to cause any harm. It should be a harmless playing out of the differences that we have between us. And if we can ensure that no one shall commit any harm on the basis of this, uh, these, these, uh, these uh, external differences that exist between one person and another, uh, if that could be ensured, that no one shall commit any harm, then it is possible to accommodate this large number of returnees without any fear or without any scare. Because uh, the other important reason is that if these people are returning healthy and fine after having spent uh, more than two to three weeks in another part of the country. It means that they are not infected. And if it means that they are healthy and not infected, that means their quarantine procedure also will be successful. Now, among them, some may be uh, asymptomatic and by a procedure of testing. What is tested are two kinds of antibodies, the short-term antibody and the long-term antibody in the in the, in the body, in the blood sample. So in the blood sample, if one has long-term antibody, which is called uh, interglobulin G protein, interglobulin G protein, if someone has, let's say 80% of interglobulin G protein in one's blood, it is for sure that that person will not be infected by COVID at all. And I'm sure that because of the historical reasons of an already existing immunity in the communities of the Northeast, most of the returnees will have this long-term immunity, else they would have by now suffered wherever they were, and some of them were in the red zones. And even in being red zones, if they haven't suffered, how is that after returning, they would suffer? So there are there is less likelihood of their suffering from COVID because COVID virus has slowed down in the case of Northeast India. Therefore, there is nothing much to worry about the returnees. Rather, these returnees have to be welcomed wholeheartedly so that they feel at home, back at home, they feel at home without any scare and fear. And they're accommodated readily in their state of quarantine, be it home quarantine or any other institutional governmental quarantine to which they have to now visit. So therefore, it is possible to have a systematic cooperative ethical response in this moment of crisis towards others who are returning from other states and other regions of the world. Now the test of our community, the test of fraternity really lies in accepting them, in facilitating their quarantine period. And also at the same time, uh, really keeping a watch that infection doesn't spread which doesn't mean ostracizing people on the basis of cultural, communal, or ethnic differences. So it is to be always remembered that we are fighting the ailment and not the ailing people. 
if there is any ailing people among them. And I can extend this by saying that we are fighting Kabir by accommodating the returnees because most of these returnees have already developed immunity. And once more immune people join our community, it really increases the level of immunity in the community. So therefore, they should be welcome in order to increase the immunity of the community. Now, immunity of the community is also described as herd immunity, H-E-R-D, herd immunity. This herd immunity is absolutely needed for fighting COVID in the long term, because in the long term, COVID cannot be fought by using medicine or vaccination. It has to depend on large amount of antibody that is created by individual members in their body and who live in a community. This community of immunity and this community of people with immunity is the resistance against the virus. We have to remember that. Therefore, we have to solidify immunity in the community by accepting uh, more people who are returning from various states and various parts of the world. We should not have any other thought or a second thought about it. Now, this description that I have given in all this actually tells you what best we can do for the people who are needy, who are marginalized. Let's say the case of migrant laborers. Migrant laborers from Northeast who are working in various metros, let's say in Goa, in Bengaluru, in Delhi, uh, in Calcutta, in Hyderabad, in, in various other cities of India. These migrant laborers actually need two kinds of support, medical support and economic support. Now, community has to really evolve means to support them. There should be an attempt to build up uh, a wider trust and cooperation between individual members of the community in, uh, in generating financial material support for these people who really need medical and financial support as they are returning home and as they need very, very seriously uh, a support to, con to, to, to continue their uh, life and livelihood. Because there are many distressed families who depend on the income of a migrant laborer uh, of their own family. Now, these laborers are deprived of their income. How will these families sustain themselves? People, the children who are going for education among these uh, family members or um, women members who require nutritional support and also medical support, how all these supports can be built up in the community that a community must really discuss and deliberate and also uh, keep up a certain kind of a moral pressure on the government based on these discussions and debates that is happening in themselves so that government can also actively take part in discussion. And this is what uh, Professor Amartya Sen yesterday in a TV interview described. The, the mode of governance that India must have at this moment is a government by discussion and not a government by dictation. So a government by di discussion would take part in the community discussion in order to ensure all kinds of support, the material, the financial, the medical, the nutritional, the food, and also the larger economic support that needs to be augmented at this point of time to support a community in accepting the, the returning migrant laborer uh, who, who has brought in a good news of immunity with him or her. Uh, they are all to be accepted in terms of building up herd immunity in the community. And that is an absolutely essential from where no diversion or deviation uh, are, really, um, uh, are, are really necessary because such deviations are going to, uh, going to uh, derogate, going to bring down our effort to contain COVID in a systematic manner. Uh, but I can see that there is a tendency of undermining uh, the returnees, as if these returnees are some kind of suspects and they are to be treated uh, with strict surveillance and supervision. Well, strict surveillance and supervision is not at the cost of compromising the human dignity and the human right of those returnees. Therefore, one has to draw a fine line between surveillance necessary for medical purposes and the human right and human dignity 
of this return is. How does one draw such a line? It's very, very important. That depends on the fine skills of understanding the situ situation. The situation can be understood in a collaborative manner. People should collaborate with the information that they have, and there should be a bridge building between the people and the government. Therefore, discussion is the only way for bridge building between people and the government. More there is an informed discussion about how to tackle COVID, how to accept the returnees, how to ensure economic and social support for anyone in this crisis period of lockdown for, for the needy and the marginalized uh, are to be discussed publicly in the community in which the government can take part and can together evolve into better policy making and its implementation for the person who is standing at the last row of the queue. Uh, now, uh, now this, this sounds you know, morally, normatively, a high premise. I don't know to what extent uh, in a democracy like India, we are able to achieve such uh, moral premises in our governing principles. But governance should be such that it is based on public morality and it addresses urgent needs of the public in an urgent manner. In many cases, the metaphor of war is used. But I don't think the metaphor of war is a good metaphor because when the enemy is an invisible enemy, how do you launch a war against the invisible enemy? The real task is to build up the community or rather rebuild the community in order to sustain our effort to contain the virus and to maintain a semblance of uh, collaboration, cooperation, and, and collective uh, building of strength in the community, which can happen only if uh, people deliberate issues openly, frankly, and thereby they draw the right kind of decisions by, by way of uh, good discussion between them. Uh, and this must happen. Uh, now, the other important thing is that uh, the picture that I drew is a picture from the bottom, is a picture from below. I have not drawn a picture from the top where uh, you have directives, you have uh, some kind of uh, norms prescribed by the government. Uh, point is that when the government prescribes such norms, who are going to implement these norms? These norms are going to be implemented by the ground level officers by the public representatives in various institutions. So these public representatives and ground level officers must have certain autonomy so that they can discuss issues with the public. But in a moment of crisis, without much discussion, a lot of steps are taken and many of the steps are not really yielding the desired results. We must review those actions which could not result into the desired result and there must be a dynamic review process not just talk taking and reporting, but also a dynamic review process of the policies and the prescriptions that have been made so far in terms of their level of success and failure on the ground. In order to achieve that, once again, the scope of discussion must also be very specialized. It must involve the right kind of experts, people who have ground level knowledge. Unless we have right set of experts uh, and the right kind of people from the governing institutions and also the ordinary public who would be able to express their needs better than any one of the experts or public representatives are all brought together to discuss what next and what should be the next higher level step in order to, uh, in order to make the situation uh, better uh, is something that really needs to be worked out. The other important issue here is the ongoing economic slowdown in which the whole country is plunged in. As far as Northeast is concerned, it has been pointed out that agriculture and the agricultural production probably in various states of Northeast uh, is a big boon. Because of huge agricultural production and surplus that Northeastern states are able to generate, they are able to sustain the demand for food and they're able to supply food locally to the people and the community. So therefore it is possible to develop a local supply chain. And in developing a local supply chain, there must be close collaboration between 
um, between individual producers, the farmers, the uh, traders, and also the community at large who can ensure a fair distribution of food material so that no one goes hungry and no famine builds up in the case of Northeast India. In other states, wherever uh, there is a possibility of famine, especially among the uh, non-agricultural sector, uh, where uh, people are hand to mouth and where uh, they have to depend on uh, supply from outside. Uh, in such cases, uh, the local supply chain have to be extended to the needy people. And probably that also could be a chip uh, in the context of Northeast Dr. India Sanji? and in the in the context of other states Hello. of uh, India. Dr. Yeah. Sanji, sure, sure. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but just a gentle reminder that it's been about 40 minutes. I request you if you could kindly okay. wrap up in yeah. a few minutes. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. Sure. Thank you. Welcome. I'm, I'm wrapping up. So the point here is that the, uh, the kind of economic slowdown that we're experiencing at this moment, that we have to overcome this economic slowdown. So to sum it up, what I was trying to argue is that we have to welcome the returnees. That is first and foremost. We have to ensure that immunity builds up in the community. Uh, and there are good news for us that COVID has slowed down in India. Therefore, there's nothing to scare and fear. So time now is to rebuild our social and collective life which we rebuild in close collaboration, in discussion, in involving various experts, even the needy people who can best express what is their need and, and uh, address those needs so that the last mile delivery shortage or last mile delivery problem can be overcome uh, in mutual discussion. If we can overcome uh, the problems of delivering things where it is to be delivered in terms of delivering cash, food, and other medical items, if we can overcome the, the constraints of delivery, it will be possible to manage COVID at this point of time in a very systematic manner. Uh, and in the context of Northeast, uh, because we are in a better situation, we should take all efforts to start our economy and at the same time maintain safety norms in a manner that uh, unwittingly we don't uh, expand the transmission of virus. And that is absolutely important. And for that, we have to act responsibly without compromising the, the choice and the freedom of the individual as well, because we live in a democracy and in a democracy, it's always a matter of individual choice and discussion to arrive at a good decision, which we need to maintain and overcome the differences that are already there in terms of race, color, caste, creed, tribe, religion, blah, blah. So we, we cannot really harp on those differences and we have to forget differences for a while in order to have a collaborative struggle, collaborative fight uh, against the COVID, which requires this uh, mutual empathy, mutual collaboration, mutual support, and also, uh, uh, in, and also an effort to, to restart the economy, to restart the, the social linkages that we have, uh, which are slowly uh, limping back to normalcy. Uh, so we have to wait for uh, the restoration of our life uh, by maintaining medical safety and security. Uh, I think uh, with this word, I conclude for a while and I'll be ready to uh, discuss matters in case there are questions. Uh, thank you all for patiently listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasanji. That was a very informative session. I think you've given us a lot of insights to think about on the responses to COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Prasanji, uh, you've yeah. given us, I think, a very different perspective of the COVID-19, probably a less grimmer picture of it, I would say, that uh, about the chances of survival, seeing that the global fear is actually really high and maybe excessive or even exaggerated at times, and also because of the infodemic. Yesterday we had a session on infodemic and how news can actually spiral out of control and a lot of misinformation can go around. Um, so I think the session has given us a really different perspective on it. I'm going to open uh, it up now to questions, if there are any from amongst the participants. Uh, you can actually unmute yourselves. I don't see any questions in the chat box right now, but uh, we can give a minute to participants to ask any questions. Uh, the rest, if you just like to, you can actually just in unmute yourselves. Yeah, okay, so uh, Dr. Capesa has a question. Capesa, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask it. I guess that would be better, yeah. Go ahead. Um, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prasanji. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is uh, vaguely related to the quarantine inequality that you mentioned and also the um, likening of the fight against the COVID-19 to a war. Yeah. So overall, um, I mean, if we look at it, the Northeast uh, during the lockdown have sort of gracefully observed the lockdown without much uh, protest, without outbursts compared to the other parts. So um, this makes me wonder if this has to do with our civilizational values that we are generally uh, law abiding people, we're generally good people, or if this has to do with our perception of the state, how we see the state and how the state sees us. So I'd be very happy to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, this reminds me of James C. Scott's uh, book. I know, Seeing as the State Sees It, Seeing Like a State, as he titled this book, in the context of Southeast Asia. Uh, he argued, Professor James C. Scott, the renowned anthropologist who has written this book on Zumias, uh, describing the migration of people of the Northeast. Uh, you must be. Heard, you must have heard about James Scott, I'm sure, seeing like a state. Now, uh, the way state sees this whole problem, you know, the problem of uh, spread of the virus, uh, state is combining two different things here. State is uh, turning a medical emergency into a political and an economic emergency. And there comes the critical question of whether uh, that results into a certain curb on our fundamental rights whether that results into a certain kind of an imposed, uh, uh, imposed difficulty in maintaining our life and livelihood. Of course, uh, from an experiential point of view, we can see that there are a lot of difficulties. But at the same time, we fall back on our families, on our community, on our society, which provides us a certain kind of a sucker which is independent of the mechanisms of the state. Now, if state can step into with a kind of help, with, a, with an attitude to provide necessary financial and material support, you know, uh, if state could have done that, the sense of crisis would have been much reduced. The kind of psychological distress people are experiencing during this period of lockdown and COVID, which is also resulting into a certain kind of suspicion, if not hate, towards certain other people or a certain other country, let's say. Uh, if, 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 if there were appropriate support system, such psychological and social psychological reactions would not have come over, that people are suspicious of another country, another people, people who are different. So therefore, our perception of the state is in terms of how state relates to us and how we relate to other people. There are two dimensions of this perception. How we relate to the state, state expects one to relate to the state in terms of following certain norms of behavior. Now these norms of behavior often undercut the, the freedom of choice, the freedom of the individual. Uh, and there comes a kind of a conflict. So state's prerogative, and the prerogative of what we have achieved in terms of our rights, in terms of our entitlements, uh, run at cross purposes. And in a crisis moment, it becomes even more acute in the sense that uh, in a crisis moment, one is looking to state for help and sustenance, which is not easily coming forth. Therefore, state is failing in its duty towards its citizens, while it is demanding citizens too much to behave in a certain manner. So there is a discrepancy here that state is creating in the usual perception of the citizen about the state. The other important issue is how we look at others. Uh, we look at others from an angularity of uh, whether the other is useful to me, whether the other uh, is, uh, is, is productive and beneficial to me. If the other does not fit into my scheme of things, one really gets really, one starts trepidating about uh, a kind of a uniform relationship with the other. And that's, that's a problem of human relations. So relations with the state and 
human relations are both at this moment in a kind of examination and re-examination. And hopefully this process of re-examination would lead us to a certain kind of a stable perspective, which is absolutely needed in this moment of containing COVID. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Prasenji, for the answer. Yeah. Um, okay. I've been hearing a lot about uh, high trust societies and low trust societies. And there has actually been a lot of debate or discussion going on about what's the best strategy in a pandemic, trust or suspicion, not towards the migrants or towards daily wage or towards infected patients, but towards the response of the government and also the response of the public where we're seeing that in high trust societies, it probably the policies that are laid down by the government may not be as stringent as policies laid down by governments from low trust societies. So you have some states or countries being able to exercise this lockdown or control the pandemic through public goodwill, whereas you see other governments having to use more stringent or authoritative measures alongside that. Uh, do you agree with this uh, term of like the existence? What, what are your, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that about high trust and low trust societies. What, what, what do you feel about that? What's happening in the world right now? Yes, the idea of trust actually needs to be re-understood in the context of COVID. Now, trust is not just linear because trust involves a, a multiple number of actors and factors. So all these actors and factors have to be taken together in order to understand trust. Now, are we able to really take cognizance of these multiple factors and multiple actors? First of all, uh, we can see a certain governmental machinery, which is directly responsible for our health and well-being. But this kind of a vision where we directly see something, you know, reduces our ability to depend on many other correlated factors. So when we emphasize on one factor and forget about many other factors, it is then then there is a problem of trust because those other factors and other actors, they also come into picture. Now that a lot of things are happening together simultaneously. On the one hand, you have my on the one hand, you have an agent. On the other hand, you for a vaccine. So a lot of these issues and factors are coming together. And they are really clouding out the existing level of trust. In fact, the whole world is suffering from a certain kind of trust deficit at this moment. And they don't really know whom to trust anymore. Can we trust the government anymore? Can we trust the medical professionals? Can we trust our immediate neighbors? Can we trust this or that? remains an open question. So therefore, uh, you know, the existing situations of low trust, low trust gets lowered. Existing situations of high trust also gets lowered. So overall, there is a decline of trust. And in this moment of decline of trust, you see, high trust or low trust societies are behaving alike. All of the people are looking for a certain ready solution. And the ready solution is not coming forth. It is getting different. How long it will get different will depend on how long it will take for us to really contain this virus. So therefore, the attack by the virus and the pandemic and its impact on our social psychological setup and our makeup is now very different than this usual categorization of high trust and low trust because trust itself is on decline. And therefore, that's another level of the problem, which is a deeper, deeper layer of this problem, which needs to be understood, re-understood, and uh, one has to work out ways out of it, which is uh, easier said than done. Mm -hmm. True. Very true. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Do we have any more questions from hello. the participants? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hello. Yes. Hello. Sure. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I can hear you. Hello. Hello. This is Richard. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So this is Richard from Silo. 
Oh, thank Richard. You. Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. how are you, Richard? So nice. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. Thank you, sir. Nice. Thank you so yeah, much, yeah. Uh, Tisto College, for this platform. And thank yeah. you so much, sir, for your insightful uh, talks. Uh, my question here is that, sir, uh, government ensuring income of the poor is something which is very important, uh, which is need to be discussed and then needs to put forward to the government, as you have said. So, but the question here is that um, how can we, in such a country where there are lots of poor people, securing the income of the poor is a big uh, Hercules task for the government. So I'm still wondering how we can, or how government can uh, take up these steps. If you can suggest uh, something on that. Yes, yes. Uh, you must have seen in the newspaper yesterday's discussion that Avijit Banerjee, the latest Nobel laureate in economics, uh, who is an Indian American, uh, has suggested. He suggested that this is the right time to introduce universal basic income. Now, what should be the level of universal basic income and how it will be transferred? Those things are issues about methodologies and procedures. But one should, on principle, agree that uh, uh, the basic universal basic income needs to be guaranteed uh, to the large number of poor people that we have in our country. Now, this requires not more than 6% of our total GDP. In one calculation, Raghuram Rajan, he calculated that over three months, if we are supplying 5,000 rupees in the accounts of each of these 45 crore migrant laborers, we give them 15,000 rupees in three months, and that requires a total expense of 65,000 crores, which is uh, somewhere around you know 0.3% of our total GDP. Now, these migrant laborers who work in informal sector contributes almost 27 to 30 percent of our GDP. Now, those who contribute 30 percent for our GDP, for them, countries spend less than 0.5 percent of our GDP over next three months. And after next three months, as the situation gets normal and these people goes back to their workplace, we can recalculate a certain level of basic income that could be infused in their uh, to them so that they're economically secure and they don't feel insecure to contribute more to the national wealth and that will require in a calculation that Avijit Banerjee has done uh, if we provide 6,000 rupees per month annually 72,000 rupees to these 45 crore of migrant laborers that will cost us around 3 lakh crores of rupees per year you see mm -hmm. which is how much which is somewhere around, you know, 4% of our total GDP per year. So if 4% of the total GDP goes in universal basic income, the output that it creates in, in terms of calculation will be at least three to four times more than the current output. You see, it's not that people will take money, they will just sit and eat, but they will create their own possibilities of production, their own possibilities of economic activity which mm -hmm. will increase the economic activity by three to mm -hmm. four folds, of which Banerjee has calculated. And I, I'm, I'm ready to believe that calculation uh, mm -hmm. as a student of economics. Uh, and I believe that uh, injecting universal basic income is going to double up our GDP in next two years itself, which will be a major upturning, major overturning of the current morass, current recessionary tendency that is set in the economy. So therefore, Universal basic income can start from the COVID moment and it can go to the moment of completely overcoming recession and coming back to 8 to 10 percent growth level in our economy, which is a wonderful suggestion and a wonderful idea, which is cost effective, affordable for the people of India. Okay, Richard. Thank you, sir. Is it okay? Thank you. Or you? Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, please. Hello. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. It's sure, great to sure. meet you, and it's a humble an opportunity to talk to you in chat. I will just uh, precisely point out my views. Sure. You talk about the global fear, suspicion. Yes. And that I just 
this is much I'm just pointing out my view is that I can see many people outside roaming randomly even after this pandemic. We know the consequences of this and we can we cannot predict to some extent what it might take to the experts are saying as might be taken two years, but that is right. not exactly we have no idea about how many years it's gonna take. So people are just uh, roaming outside that does is it doesn't mean that there is still a lack of fear in them. This basically means that in, to some extent, they are also putting their lives and other life in the risk. We have no idea about uh, how it's going to cause. So, so can we say that even if the fear is exaggerating, if the fear is saving lives, what's wrong in it? Because you have mentioned about global fear, that it is exaggerating, which is basically, uh, primarily you mean to say that according to my understanding, we don't have to be fear. So as part of my understanding, fear is, as of the situation, current situation, fear can be a shield for our states and the people around globally. So don't you think fear is necessary in this case? Yeah, your question is very valuable question, you know, because uh, that's the crux of the issue at this moment in our behavior and in deciding what should be the norm of behavior. Now, uh, look at the advanced countries. They are less fearful. You know, look at USA. Uh, a part of US economy is running. Look at the New York City. I mean, there is still, you know, people moving, carrying out economic activities, despite huge death toll. Now, one argument that is given about New York City, you know, New York City is supposed to be the capital of the world at this moment, because all the major economic activities, the huge amount of capital, uh, both manpower, scientific, technical, and also financial capital that is there in economic, in economic terms in New York City is the highest in the world. Now, if you look at New York City, are they really afraid? You know, I don't see to be... Uh, yeah. Hello. Dr. Prasanchi. Hello, can you all still continue to hear? Yes, ma'am, I can still hear you, but I can't hear Sir Prasanchi. I think he's been cut off, yeah. Dr. Remy, could you please find out for us if there's anything wrong? I think there's probably a network issue here. It's been going on and off throughout the meeting, but hold on, let me, let's check. Yeah, I think he's logged, he's logged out. Yeah, uh, ma'am, he, uh, he just called me and uh, uh -huh. I'm just receiving this. Give me one minute. Okay, okay. Just allow him to come back and maybe quickly sum up the question for Ning Dao Lung. And you right, can probably ma treat that as the last question unless anyone else has any more questions. Liz, we could probably treat that as the final. Ning Dao Lung, I think you're the only UG student that has attended webinar it's really good to see you actually attending the webinar voluntarily like that yeah it is it's a great opportunity for me so i just grabbed the opportunity oh uh, hello ma'am yeah 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 i i just contacted him and then the, i will be uh he will be coming in in two minutes okay two minutes okay yeah two, okay, minute, two minutes that's kind of, in time uh yeah yeah okay um in the meantime, of course, does anyone have any questions about it? Uh, I hope the rest of you all enjoyed, you know, the session and you found it informative. I think we have a few of our staff left and I know the internet connectivity is really disruptive today. I've been logging in and out also throughout this session.
We hope to be conducting more webinars. Uh, just for the information of everyone who's here, our next Dot Talks webinar is scheduled on Friday. That's 8th of May at 3 p.m. And our speaker is going to be Dr. Shobana P. Matthews. She's an assistant associate professor in the Department of English Studies at Christ University. Uh, she is also one of our advisory editorial members of uh, Tetsuo Interdis uh, Interdisciplinary Journal. So she'll be speaking on the topic free wheeling with Bob Dylan. This information I think would will be going out on the internet shortly. So if you're interested, then as usual, you can just uh, sign up, register yourselves uh, for the webinar and uh, attend it on 8th of May yeah, at 3 p.m. So please try to do that. And um, if anyone here also has uh, resource people, who would be interested in speaking on, you know, our Doc Talks webinar from your own universities or professors or even yourselves? I understand that the faculty are soon going to be presenting webinars uh, from each of the schools, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, no pressure on anyone, but this is more of, I think most of us here are, yeah, all from the digital community right now. So, yeah, this, this is an exercise for each one of us, and also. Uh, even for students, the students recently had a student webinar, or the UG students. The PG students are also, um, hopefully, will be seeing a student webinar from them. And uh, the higher secondary, the class students are also planning to organize a student webinar. So these are the things that we're looking forward to. This and hopefully should happen on a regular basis. Yeah, Ningtola? Yes, ma'am. Uh, on the other day, the PTS uh, session that we have, yeah. Our director have just yeah. mentioned about if we can organize something like debate or competition for the students. Is oh, it yeah. our yeah. college noise or arranging or kind of thing about that? It will be very interesting, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Um, we can think about it, actually. Uh, the student council has also mentioned that they're, what about organizing a student fest, you know, an online fest, and oh. debate can be a part of it or a different set of activities. They were even mentioning like singing a song, I think some institutes or uh, right, organizations have been composing songs from uh, putting together songs from different singers like that. So um, th those are things that I think we can think about. Why why don't you get in touch with um, our student advisors, you know, Merang and also Sorry Ting also, and right. maybe we can put together something. By the way, our general secretary Sorry Ting, he is going to be live on Instagram tomorrow uh, yes. on Edu Edu Center. Yeah, so he's going to be talking about the college and his experience. Um, you can put in any questions live. I think they've been doing it for all the different institutes in Nagaland. Yesterday, St. Joseph, a student from St. Joseph College, Jakama, uh, was uh, speaking on uh, St. Joseph and the admission procedure and all other, you know, any questions that were fielded at him on Instagram. So, sorry, I think is going to be doing something similar tomorrow, uh, 7th of May. I I've forgotten the time now, but uh, it'll be posted on our Instagram page and even on Edu Center. That's Edu Center Nagaland. So, um, you can catch him there. Yeah. Sure. Okay, really sorry about this. I know that today, you know, it's kind of been disruptive the network and thanks to all the teachers for patiently <laughs> staying logged in and waiting um we'll probably just wind up with this question so that he can just answer Ning Dalung and try to conclude the session so let's wait and see dr Rimi, any updates oh uh, yeah ma'am well, actually uh he asked me to resend the link to his messenger okay. I, okay. I did it uh, I did it and then now by now I think I think I don't know uh, his phone maybe uh, he, he just texted me uh -huh, uh, he's uh -huh. getting back and it just opened uh, I think from another laptop or something okay. so I, I don't know maybe his uh, battery is out or okay you know, oh okay uh, okay things okay. Like that, so. okay otherwise you know if, if it's becoming difficult for him what we can do is um, Ning Tao Lim and we can connect Ning Tao Lung with him later also for them to you know yeah. discuss or yeah. um through email also because we have yeah. his email id we can provide that also um if that's not a problem so uh you can just let him know yeah ma'am he just he just texted me now that he okay. just he just opened he just uh, i i also want him to just come and then conclude the session okay yeah of course uh, so yeah. I, if we can just extend one more minute so. okay okay 
Of course, the further questions may not be possible today. Yeah, I think everyone, yeah, but we yeah. have our email ID, dot talks at Tetsuo College. I'm just going to type it here for everyone in right. case you guys want to email or uh, in case you guys have suggestions Hello. on anyone who can come and speak on dot then, talks. Yeah, yeah, then what do we do, sir? Yeah. These are the glitches that you know, uh, can't just help sometimes and it's just out of our control. So <laughs> I think we'll all just have to bear with it. So this is the email ID I've posted in the chat box, uh, .talks at Tetsuo College ORG. Uh, uh, I'd like to especially request, you know, the professors here, the teachers who are here from your own respective universities, if you can get someone uh, who'd be, you know, interested in talking on .talks. Um, as you know, the topics are open for anyone. And so you can choose a topic that's of interest to you. Uh, a relevant topic uh, also draws in more people. Uh, so that can be kept in mind when selecting topics. Our teachers, I know, are going to be presenting very soon. So uh, you can keep that in mind when you're trying to select a topic. Of course, it can be from your own discipline also. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, uh, it so happened that I think uh, uh, it, it is looking like that he is going to take a little longer time. So he okay. uh, he he sent me uh, his apology that uh, okay, okay. Uh, the last part he couldn't be able to complete the session. So I am now okay. handing over to the entire thing to you so that we can wrap okay. up. And then for Nita okay. Long, I think uh, he can still connect with Sir and uh, I can also. I have. I can also just uh, lead him and guide him to 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 talk to him also uh, in okay. different formats. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ning Jalang, you okay with that? Yes, ma'am. I'm okay with that. It's okay. fine. Okay. Okay. But thanks. I think that was a really valid uh, question uh, that you posed. And, yeah. You know, so uh, that's something food for thought. I think we can keep on reflecting on some of the questions that he posed to us about whether, you know, COVID-19 and this lockdown has actually brought societies closer together and um, how different governments are responding to it. Um, I think there's so much, there's so much debate and differences of opinions on this, but so um, it's good to keep on hearing different perspectives. Let's keep reflecting on it. And uh, with that, I think we're just going to conclude the session for everyone. Thanks so much for attending. Thanks, Dr. Remy, for connecting us with Dr. Prasanjit Biswas. Hopefully we can hear from him in the future again or whenever he comes on campus, whenever the lockdown is removed. Hopefully we can have these speakers who are in Talks webinar keep coming, uh, come to the campus for future workshops, seminars like that. So uh, finally, just a reminder, everyone, we have our next Doc Talks webinar on Friday at 3 p.m. Please check the uh, staff and student intranet for more information. Okay, thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Okay.